Hello everyone, thanks for coming tonight. Yeah. Could I get you to take seats where you can find them? Uh, there's TVs around on the screen as well, so feel free to sit where you can. Again, thank you everyone for coming. It's great to see you all. Quite a large turnout, which is pretty cool. Obviously, thanks to the folks at Funding Circle and Code 42 for hosting the space this evening. Providing with food and beer and chairs. So, cool now. Um, agenda for tonight. So, uh, I guess we'll kick it off. Without further ado, Kristen. Good evening, good evening everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about thinking outside the box using VMs. So I'm just going to introduce myself. My name is Christian. I'm, I'm the client platform engineer here at Funding Circle, predominantly focused on Apple technologies. Sorry, just had a few clicker issues. Um, so I'm going to start off with a problem scenario. And then I'm going to talk to you about how people react to change. And then I'm going to talk about C testing and VMs and how we do it here at Funding Circle. And then I'm going to give you an example of one of our JSON files. And then I'm going to take some questions. So first of all, in the room, how many of you people know who this person is? <laughs> what does William Wallace have to do with IT? Does anyone know? Put some hands up. Killed a lot of people. Really efficient. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to introduce a little quote. So there's a difference between us. You think people of this land exist to provide you with position. I think your position exists to provide those people with freedom. And I'm going to make sure that they have it. So what's this got to do with IT? Our job is to provide our end users with a system that's stable and be ahead of the curve and make sure that they're happy. Uh, sometimes you might think, what am I doing here? Why am I doing what I'm doing? But you're here for your end users to make a difference. So I'm going to use the IT crowd to explain something that we were working on. So hopefully this is quite fun. So how many of you start the day with how, how sorry? Um, how many people start the day with have you tried to turn it on and off again? Yeah. Put your hands up. That's all I've got. <laughs> <laughs> how many of you focus on actually what the problem is? If you can raise your hand. So here at Funding Circle, we have a small problem. We were getting updates delivered to people's machines. We weren't really actually checking what was going on. We were the last to know what was actually happening. So we used to get loads of tickets coming to us, and we were like, ah, oh, we didn't know about that. But actually, we should have known it. It was a bit of a reactive mentality. Um, so we thought, sat down with each other, and thought about what could we potentially do to resolve this issue. So first of all, we decided let's burn whatever we did. <laughs> we don't really care about how stuff is reacting. We want to do something different. So, how do we do that? So we first of all decided that we want to start pre-testing stuff. We first looked at equipment in our cupboards, seeing what we could potentially use. But actually, let's put hands up to everyone. How many people have machines in their cupboards that are DP enabled that you can no longer use because people spill water on it or they're damaged to end of life capacity? So. What could you potentially use that for? So I'm going to go to that slightly later on, but let's start off with something. So, first time we looked at some things that was happening. Some people choose to ignore the situation, put it to one side and stop caring about it. They look at it just like him and go, you know what? It's actually not my problem. I don't really care. Um, but that doesn't always get what you want it to do. You sometimes, get people who look at the risk, <laughs> they move it to one side, don't really care about it. It's not their problem because they've moved it on. That sometimes can cause a little bit of an issue. But here at Funding Circle, we like to believe we act on it. As you can see, he slightly fails at putting the fire out, but that's fine. We live and learn, it's, it's everyday life. But actually, it's controlled. So putting this within a VM 
and doing your stage testing within that gives you an opportunity to test that properly. So how do we do it differently? So we get a Slack notification every time Apple puts out a beta release. We decided to use MDS because it's a GUI rather than the install Python and someone has to set that up on a shell. We take that seeded image that we get, convert it to a DMG with auto DMG. We have pre-configured JSON files. One, we label non-DEP. That's our playground. We can trash it, we can try new things. If we get it wrong, it goes in the bin. And then we have the DEP one, which is like for like with our environment. We can challenge stuff within that. We then use VFuse to call that up, which gives us our fully customizable options. And then we start the VM to start playing. From this, we're allowed to do what we need to do. So I'm just going to take a second to deep dive into what our, our JSON files look like. So at the top here, you see I have our sample of our non-DEP workflow. So in our JSON file, we have a source DMG at the top. Slightly down below it, we put where we're going to put that VM. Look, there's no serial on here. We don't need a serial from our cupboard at this one point because this is our playground. So every one of our engineers who are doing testing has exactly the same platform to test off. We then look slightly deeper on. We have another file within our source connection. It's got a DEP serial number. This is the machines that I spoke about earlier that's sitting in the cupboard that you could potentially use for testing. This gives us an opportunity to test off and actually get back to our end users proactively what's actually happening. So a great example of use for the DP scenario, the latest Apple OS comes out, we already start to test it. We can test the performance on particular applications. For example, when we transition from to Catalina, sorry, transition to Catalina, we had some small issues with certain applications not working. But actually we're ahead of the curve. We can advise the users before they do anything that this application might not work and we have a hot fix for that. So from moving from a reactive mentality, we actually move into a proactive mentality. We're one step ahead of our end users. So the kicker's having it's like a mind of his own. Coronavirus. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, so, <is> it <laughs> so uh, here's just an example of us just spinning up our VM. Within seconds, we've got a test lab to do some simple testing. This one here reaps the benefits of what we're trying to do. We want it to move from a reactive mentality into a positive mentality. So here's an example of a blank canvas sample file, which has no configuration, allows us to start doing what we want to do. Within minutes, our engineers will be able to spin up what they need to do. Don't need to go to the cupboard, spend half an hour trying to do an internet recovery, and then it fails for them. We are trying to make sure that we are ready for what we need to be doing. Our day is all about being proactive and ensuring our end users are happy. So, one of the most important benefits for us is that it's, it saves us a lot of time in terms of what we're doing. We standardise and we can share this across our whole department. When you know that your day is extremely busy, it's important that you look for simple ideas. This simple workflow has helped us to enhance to where we want to get to eventually. As, that, as you can see, I've spent enough time talking for it to start setting up. So, to round this off, I just want to share a few quotes from my team. Um, and we're all trying to figure out today, how can we make this a team effort? Because as a team, we get stuff together done. I'm not going to read all the quotes, because they're something that we can absorb later on. But I just want to say thank you, and that's the end of my slides. Anyone got any questions? Great. <coughs> Put one over here. So how much of the <coughs> first uh, steps of the process are automated? So, uh, so the first part of downloading the seed and stuff like that, that's not automated. The JSON files are all pre-configured with all the stuff that we need. We just tell it when we create a new DMG, where that location. So we just edit that Git um, script and we just pass it on to where we need it to be. So uh, there is someone that manually downloads the new seed and puts it in where, where it has to go. Yeah, that's correct. Cool. Thank you.
Perfect. Enjoy the rest of your night, everyone. Thank you very much. Let's see, we just have the next one. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we've now got Paul from Co42. Talk to you about some questions. Thank you. No slides guarantee was what uh, I, I promised. Um, if anyone's really disappointed about that, I've got a 53 slide deck from my marketing team. It's up to you. Hands up. So, 53 slide. No, oh, good. Old. Excellent. Other than that, it's going to be um, 15 minutes of uh, 15, 20 minutes of demo. Uh, my name is Paul Martin. I work for Code 42. I've been with Code 42 for the last four years. And uh, when I first started Code 42, some of you may have heard of uh, Crash Plan, which was the de facto uh, backup tool that I think most Mac users use. Um, the reason I joined wasn't because I was interested in backup. I couldn't really sort of care less about backup. Um, but what was interesting was where Code 42 was actually going with the technology and the metadata that they were capturing and uh, what we were actually going to do with it, that excited me. Uh, it take, it's taken a little longer than I'd anticipated to actually get something um, to the market that uh, I, I would say from a technical viewpoint we find exciting, but you know, much more than that. Exciting technology, sorry, hold on a bit. Ooh. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, I shall keep this here and I shall demo with one hand. Right. Okay, but it, exciting technology needs to be compelling as well. And I think we've got something here that is going to be of interest to most of you in the room. Um, one thing that I know from being a Mac user is that uh, I do not want my device to be treated like a Windows device. If you lock this down and make it into a dumb terminal, I'm not going to thank you for it as an end user. That's not the way I want to work. And invariably, most of the customers and prospects that I talk to, that's exactly it. It's a cultural difference um, using a Mac to using any other um, kind of device. You know, I expect to have data sitting here locally. There are lots of applications that I need to use to do my job. I need to shift large amounts of data. Um, so again, you know, I want the freedom to be able to do that. Now, the problem we've got is that that conflicts with the security requirement to try and lock things down and make sure people like me, when I move on, don't take data when I leave and go to a competitor, for example. So again, that's what this is all about. It's all about making sure that the end user experience from a Mac viewpoint is um, you know, frictionless. You know, so I, you know, if I move stuff around to USB or if I copy stuff to Dropbox, the appropriate response is not to kick me out of this machine, it's to find out, you know, is this something that I should be interested in and maybe take action, um, the appropriate response to the action that has been taken, or is this something that I maybe shouldn't care about? And again, what we're providing here, if you look at the landing page that we've got, is you know, it, it's a very simple thing. And the, the kind of things I'm looking for here are, you know, from a high fidelity alert perspective, are there a large number of file events and a low number of users? And that's the kind of thing that I'm interested in here. So I can click on this pretty much straight away. I can see, well, hang on a minute. Um, Sean and Beverly have been quite busy here, so I might want to sort of have a look at this and figure out you know, what it is they've actually been taking. Now, I do know that Sean um, is one of my departing employees. He's going to be leaving the organization soon. And if I click on that, I can get a little bit more context behind that. So let's just click on Sean Cassidy's profile. Now the interesting thing here is that I can see that he's accepted a position at uh, a competitor. Uh, all the other information that we see in here, that's actually been plugged in from Optus. We're using some attributes in there. Again, you know, the last thing we want to do is provision users inside this system and then have to deprovision users inside this. Why not do everything inside one source of truth? So Optus, the thing that we use uh, at Code42. Um, and again, you know, I can see, right, okay, well, this particular individual, they're a Java engineer, so I'm in the security team. I don't know Sean uh, from, from Adam. I don't know who he is. Um, but I do have some context now. And this is what you need. The security and good security information is all about context. It's about having that view of the events, but contextually, you know, seeing exactly what this is and cross-correlating with other events. So, for example, this individual has now handed in their resignation letter. So, therefore, um, I might want to look at them further. Now, one of the things that um, I ask our you know, customers and prospects alike are, 
what is the process that you've got for offboarding a new user? And I, I get the same response back pretty much all the time. We take their laptop back, we get their phone, we get their door pass, we deprovision them and set up the directory, blah, blah, blah. Um, what do you do to monitor them? Okay, well, after that, because now we're no longer leaving, we're going to put them into an extra monitoring mode. So we're going to you know, we're keep a close eye on those guys. Too late. Damage is already done. Because they've probably taken what they need 30 to 60 or possibly even 90 days ago. And this is what um, the history with Code 42 provides you. So back in the old days, when we used to do um, backup, um, that metadata that uh, goes with that provides you with valuable context. So now I can see, okay, well, hang on a minute. This guy works in uh, engineering, he's a Java engineer, he's moving source code here, and also zip files. Zip files are very interesting because um, anything could be in there. And it's a nice, easy way to um, obfuscate data because I'm not necessarily looking for zip files, I'm looking for source code. I'm looking for other things that are associated with applications. Those are the things of interest for me. But zip files are, um, you know, one of our um, customers is. CrowdStrike, and uh, you know they, they, they've got a great solution for you know checking out stuff and making sure that stuff moving across the network is you know going to places it's supposed to, and if it isn't, flag it up. And they intercepted this kind of traffic, so they saw a zip file going from uh, one of their development team, and they intercepted it. They grabbed it. Thing is, it was password protected, so they couldn't open it. But they were a Code 42 customer. Um, and what we provide, because of the backup solution we have, we have every single version of every single file. We also have every single deleted file that's ever been um, on that particular device. So we were able to give them that history. We were able to go back in time, have a look at the version before it was password protected, and see exactly what was in there. We're also able to provide them with context and what other files have been touched by the WinRAR process of this um, individual use as well. And again, that information was shown up there as well. So let's have a look at uh, one of these zip files. Okay. Well, let's have a look at all of them, actually. There we go. So I can see Project Kodiak. That looks quite interesting. Now, we capture a lot of metadata that goes with that, as I mentioned before. We also have the files. So again, the MB5 hash is associated with that. Why is that important? Well, it's a bit like being on a crime scene. You know, this is the fingerprint, but um, a fingerprint is just a fingerprint if I don't have a body or a suspect attach it, uh, to attach it to. And also, when it comes to forensic investigation, if I have the MD5 hash, it's just an MD5 hash, unless I've got the file that goes with it. If I can get the file that goes with it, now I have evidence. Now we also capture other pieces of information, uh, you know, the public IP address, so roughly where did it happen. We have the timestamp, when did it happen? And again, the crucial piece of information here, the actual file. So let's um, have a look at that file, see what's in there. Open it up as fast as my internet connection will allow me. And uh, where did that move to? There it is. Okay. And I will buy a pint for anybody who can tell me what that is. But there you go. Valuable IP. Um, I know that because I've downloaded it. I can see exactly what they're doing. I can actually use this information to search for this across my environment if this is moving. Uh, moving laterally uh, to other individuals that they've got hold of this and they shouldn't have access to it, again, I'm going to see it, okay? So that's the kind of thing that we can do with this. If we have a look under uh, Save Searches, which is built on Forensic Search, which is one of the features that we underpin this with, again, this, this lens, this uh, you know, contextual view of stuff. I can also see other things in here as well. So again, let's have a look at this one. Okay. So lots of source code files. And why is this interesting? Because we can use this to search for any files that have been touched by any applications. Some of the things that um, come back to me from prospects and customers alike, again, are things like uh, well, Slack, Teams. You know, we don't know where their stuff goes to or from. Well, we can provide you with that information. We can see um, if stuff is moving via Dropbox, if it's moving via Slack, and you know, security is a game of whack-a-mole if you're going to start you know, blocking things and locking things down. So the next best thing to actually having something that is foolproof and being able to lock stuff down is having visibility. And also, um, from a, a blocking perspective, what I said at the start, you know, I don't really 
um, want you to try and block me from what I'm doing. I need to be able to collaborate. I need to be able to share stuff. But you, from an IT admin and IT security perspective, need to be able to be sure that what I'm doing is legitimate work activity or not. And that's what we can do here. So we've tied this to the WinZip process. This was what the um, application was about that was used to actually touch this file. Um, whether it's Slack, whether it's Dropbox, whether it's FTP, whether it's curl, we're going to see it. It doesn't really matter. Some of the other things that, you know, people, the weird and wonderful things that people use, things like Firefox Send, those kinds of things, again, we can see that. People's Gmail accounts, again, nice easy way to get data out of an environment. Again, we're going to be able to see that. And we can provide you with some um, other interesting stuff in there as well. So we weren't able to do this because this was WinZip, but you can see that there are a couple of other fields there. We've got the URL, which will tell us where it went to. We also have the Windows title, which will actually grab some information from that as well. So this, meta this metadata is you know, quite valuable in determining um, what individuals were doing with um, these pieces of information. How long have I got, by the way? Before I... <laughs> hours. <laughs> hours. Hours. Okay. Captivated. <laughs> Captivated audience. I love you guys. Right. So let's have a look at um, Sean Cassidy again, because um, there, there's a couple of other things that uh, I just want to tell you about this um, that can be quite interesting. It's not only endpoint activity. Endpoint activity is important. Uh, but also cloud file activity as well. We're at Google House. We use uh, Google Drive. And um, you know, just because I've got a fancy job title with technical in the title doesn't mean that I'm immune from stupidity. Um, far from it. And what I did last year when we first had this was I wanted to share a document that was an insider document um, regarding some of our professional services processes and things like that. And I wanted to share it with 20 other people inside my SE group, but I couldn't be bothered to type in all their email addresses. So what I thought I'd do was share it with everybody at Code42. I accidentally shared it publicly with the link. Now, this is a nice, easy way to get data out of an environment because there's no challenge issue, no response expected. Anybody can download that file, and you wouldn't know who did it. But one of the things that we do is we capture the individual that elevated the permissions of that file, me, and within five minutes, I had a phone call from the IT guys going, hey, did you uh, actually mean to share that document publicly with the link? And uh, far from it. Absolutely not. Um, I, I may be an idiot, but I'm not malicious. So I went back in and I corrected my mistake, um, you know, forthwith, other than suffer the wrath of the IT uh, department. But uh, again, you know, that can happen to anybody. Um, so again, this is the kind of thing that uh, we can uh, mitigate as well. Now we pointed the, uh, the endpoint file activity was an interesting one because um, we do drink our own champagne, eat our own dog food as well, at Code 42 as you would expect. And we pointed this at our engineering team in a blind test. The results were interesting because with um, a 100% success rate, with quite a big engineering team at Code 42, back in Minneapolis, we predicted all four of the departures within a specific month. And they all had something in common. They touched a lot of files. They moved a lot of files. A lot of files went to removable media, cloud services. And, uh, and another interesting thing in here, which isn't necessarily malicious, deleted files. A lot of deleted files, um, you know, because when people hand their devices back, they get rid of their iTunes library, all their photos, and all sorts of other nonsense that are, that, that, that's in there as well that they don't want IT to see. Um, and they will probably hand me back something that has um, you know, the root um, directory downwards, you know, pr pretty much wiped. But we're Code 42, remember we um, were famous back in the day for backup. We all have those files um, for you as well, so if anybody deletes this, throws it in the river, doesn't matter. We still got access to that data and we can still get access to it for you, um, regardless of what happens to this device or the user that owned it. But it's a good indicator as to whether or not somebody's actually intending to leave um, the, the environment as well. And we're adding to this um, over time. So this uh, you know, lens that we've got, this is the first of a few that we're going to be releasing throughout 2020. Things like suspicious behavior. Again, we'll be monitoring things like um, a user's work hours, for example. And again, that cross-correlation is important. 
Um, I do quite a bit of work on a Sunday evening, well, not quite a bit of work, I mean, that's, that's a bit of a stretch. Um, I, I do about an hour on a Sunday evening <laughs> just to get myself prepared um, for Monday morning for a few things that I have to do. So copying data and stuff like that at that time is probably not something that's going to be interesting to the security team. Now, if I did that on a Saturday morning and there was a lot of data moving, that's probably going to be of much more interest because these are outside of core hours. And what it's going to do is learn each individual user's working pattern. If you start to work with developers, you know that um, developers don't work nine to five, and, and I don't know any uh, development team or any developer in any development team that works nine o'clock to five o'clock. They work weird hours. Um, they can come in at uh, you know three o'clock in the afternoon and sort of leave at three a.m. or whatever. It, it makes no difference. But each developer has their own style and preference for hours that they work. And again, this is going to learn what those are, and then we're going to you know cross correlate those kind of things and give you a weighting as to whether or not you should look at this. Now we're capturing millions of events here, and possibly even for our largest customers, billions of events. And the last thing that the security team wants is more alerts. You know, I've never met a security guy that says, hey, you need to give me more alerts. They don't want that. They want actionable information. They want actionable alerts. And this is what we're gonna give you. We're giving you stuff that is, you know, like, again, you know, those nine zip files there, gold dust. I wanna see what's inside those. And why is somebody, in that field, in that department, uh, in that job, zipping up files. You know, again, you know, for me, that's probably an amber, if not a red flag. And I want to be able to see exactly what's going on in there. Um, maybe the other stuff, you know, the other 855 files, I don't really care about those too much. You know, I mean, if, if the nine files might tell me what I need to know um, pretty much straight away. A lot of this stuff is um, reactive. I'm just finishing and wrapping up now. You know, you're all enthralled, but uh, you know, just, just stick, to the, stick to the agenda, stick to the rules, and talk to me uh, later. Um, Mario's over there, he's my walking wallet, yay. Um, and he will buy beers and stuff. But, rules. This is more proactive. I build a rule, somebody breaks a rule, it's going to generate an alert, and then it's going to give me the information that um, I've requested from it. Uh, when I click on create a rule, it could be one of two things. It could be exposure on the endpoint. It could be cloud share permissions um, changes. That the thing that I mentioned before that you see that I, I've already done and explained, um, or exposure on the endpoint. In which case, I give the rule a name. I can give it a description, severity, depending on what it is that I'm looking at. Send it to some interested parties. Now, these could be security team, IT team. It could also be line of business, um, you know, managers as well. Um, who probably understand a little bit more about the context of what the user is trying to do or trying to achieve and whether or not they should actually be doing these um, particular actions and using these applications to move data around. So again, a uh, browser and other app will let me see um, you know, if somebody's using uh, stuff uh, via a browser, via Slack, the FTP curl, and those other things that I mentioned. Uh, removable media. Um, this is an interesting one because uh, one of our biggest customers is IBM. Uh, a couple hundred thousand users, probably the largest mobile workforce on the planet. Um, very famously last year they said, right, that's it, no more USB drives for anybody. And uh, you know, they have you know, probably thousands upon thousands of users that are an exception group um, to, to that particular policy. So uh, the only other thing you can do there, uh, it, it, they're no different to any other organization in terms of percentage because a lot of people will have legitimate business um, you know, reasons for actually using um, uh, USB drives. Again, yeah, it's, it, but but the, the next best thing is to monitor those things. And even the people that you have blocked might not be as blocked as you think they are because there are different ways and means around um, get, getting access to um, USB drives and external drives. Moving stuff to cloud and sync folders. Again, if our corporate standard is OneDrive, this could be quite interesting because now I want to have a look at personal OneDrive. Um, so we do have the concept in here of um, trusted domains, uh, which means that anything that is you know, company business and company domain um, OneDrive uh, usage, I don't really want to see that. I don't want to ignore it. Um, but I do want to see personal OneDrive. I want to know if um, you know, Paul's copying stuff to um, his, his, his own OneDrive account or, or not. Um, we have simple thresholds in here. Uh, so, for example, the number of files or the, the size of files. Again, really dependent on 
uh, you know, the department that you're working with, marketing departments, they're going to be working with large files. So again, the amount of data is going to be important. Um, development teams, probably going to be lots and lots of small files, you know, lots of scripts, lots of shell scripts, lots of JSONs, whatever it may be. Um, but there, there's going to be a lot of files and they're going to be pretty small. And how often do I want to be notified? Well, within 15 minutes is, you know, quite aggressive. I think, but um, we can do it that way. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get it in 15 minutes. It'd probably be a little bit sooner than that, depending on um, the workflow, how you know how quick the information is up to the cloud and back down again and into your inbox. And then the file category. So again, the kind of things that I'm interested in here, from a development standpoint, source code script. Certainly interested in zip files. So again, those are the kinds of things that I can look in there as well. And then I can apply it to users, or I can exclude certain users and groups and things in there as well. And then once I've done that, obviously somebody breaks a rule. Hopefully that triggers an alert. You get that dropping into your inbox, and it's going to take you to the uh, forensic search tool, and it's going to give you a list of all of those files, and you can click on those, find out if they're important or not get all the metadata, get the recent version, get the exact match that goes with that. That's actually quite new. So we've got two versions in there, the most recent, and the exact match as well. I'm going to stop talking now, give someone else a chance to come up here and uh, present to you folks. But um, uh, hopefully that's piqued your interest. If you do have any other questions in terms of how this works, how it all hangs together and all the rest of it, um, you know, grab me before I have too many more beers. I'll be able to explain it to you. Um, otherwise, you'll have to deal with Richard and Mario over there. Um, but yes, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you, and um, thank you very much again for your attention. So uh, next up is James from Move, my team. Um, let's talk about backups. So, Hi guys, so my first time talking about one of these, so please bear with me. Uh, so, first of all, you think I'm going to be nuts. Time machine. It's nothing to do with it, don't worry. So, the idea being that we had some few, so first of all, I'm James. I'm currently the operations manager and infrastructure consultant for Move IT. So I look after our internal jobs as such, projects and that sort of thing. And I also help design our service solutions for our clients uh, and make sure that they're happy with what we do. So the idea being behind this, and if you want to follow along, got a QR code, there's some of our notes, and if, I'll put it at the end as well. So if you want to take anything away, it's all on there, you can have a read, and if there's anything you want, feel free to read it. So, why do we bother? So, in our experience, and I'm going to make that key, our experience, uh, we had a few issues with some backup systems that we used. So, what happened with us and using third-party tools? So, the issues we had were data was stored in a proprietary format. So by that we mean that it's stored in a way that the software, only that software can understand. So when you try and restore a piece of information, if the software isn't available, like a disaster recovery situation, you need to install the server followed by that software to get your data back. Not ideal in a time crunch where you need, you've got a client screaming at you, I want my server. So the data can also be compressed Again, a great idea. It makes it easier to store, takes less space. Um, but again, it takes longer to decrypt because it has to decompress it and then it's available. So data can be very expensive to store. So there are areas of the cloud as such that is expensive. AWS, especially Azure, they are very expensive to store large quantities. I'm talking terabytes of data. Um, with their systems. And depending on the solution you choose, the, the restoration of this data can be very time consuming, i.e. tapes, deep freeze, that sort of thing. It can take time to get that data into a recovery media, and then again it takes time to get it from the recovery media to your server. All steps that are not great when you're running an MSP that needs client information very quick. 
So, where do we start? Time Machine. Now, we knew Time Machine as a Mac company. Obviously, it was designed by Apple to be an end-user product. It's not commercially viable. But the idea behind it, the good points for it, it's very space efficient. Using hard links and everything else, it doesn't write the same file over and over and over again. If it doesn't change, it leaves it alone. It's generally very fast because of this. So not having to back up a terabyte of data every hour makes it quicker. Every backup gets incremented and differentially merged into each other. So every snapshot you see in a time machine backup is seen as a full backup every single hour that it runs. And it's very easy to recover from the end user device. So you can go in, find your time, your time stamp you're looking for, grab your file, drag and drop. It's done. There's no decryption, there's no secondary software, there's nothing that you need to do. Now obviously with every piece of software there are some bad ones. So if you're running it from a time machine server, it can be very unreliable. So network speeds, dropouts, shutting your laptop, going to sleep, it'll kill the transfer. The backup has to start again because it's unable to continue a backup. So Mac OS server is dead. It's no longer a business option. It doesn't work in, mar in large businesses. There's not a lot it does anymore. A lot is moved to system preferences. Third party time machine tools are available. Synology, QNAP, they all do one. They work, but they're not great. And it's exclusive to Mac OS. If you use Linux or Windows, you can't use it. It's an un unusable system for outside the Mac OS system. So we thought we'll try and do our own way. But some concern, uh, security considerations before we started. So the data should always be encrypted. If it's client information, we need to make sure it's safe. So we went with SSH. If we're gonna transfer over the internet, it needs to be encrypted all the way along. It needs to be encrypted at rest. So your disks encrypted with the highest level encryption possible so that if any of your data is stolen, it's taken, it's encrypted along the way. It's inaccessible to the person that's taken that data. And if you're going to use internet ports, change them. Don't use the default ones. Port 22 is one of the most scanned ports in the world because it's a frequent access point. Don't use it. So we used Arctic. Reasons for it, it's native to Mac OS and to Linux. It's generally quick depending on your environment and it works quite well. I mean, it takes a snapshot, it moves your data from one place to another, it's easy. You can get it to merge differences, so it can be treated as a time machine backup with the right variables. So to start with, we started small. Everyone knows rsync. So your simple rsync command, rsync, your variables, your source, your destination. That will clone your information from one file to another. And then your options for those files, minus R to recurse all the way down, H for human readable, L for following links, and grab all that information as well. And then capital H to preserve any hard link files that you have. So if you want to complete that backup over the internet, quite simple, use SSH. So it builds a little bit on the script. Oh, sorry. So again, we're gonna recurse all the way down. Yeah. But this time we're going to use the dash E to execute a specific protocol. So that protocol in this case is SSH, and again, use a different port. Don't use port 22, obvious reasons. Except this time we're going to use your source, your username at the destination, followed by the app, the, the, your server name, and then the path that you wish that those files can replicate to. Now, that's quite simple. That's rsync in a nutshell. Now, to turn it into a backup, now these are not where you're at the moment. This is a copy. It's not a backup. It's a clone of your information in a second location. It's great if you want a snapshot restore. If you're looking for a backup, you want ver you want variations, you want timestamps, you want to be able to go back versions of your files. 
So we added some elements to it. Date version is obviously the key one. You want to be able to go back in time, whether that's an hour, a day, a week, a month, a year, etc. So to build that in, we added the variable. And that variable, to start with, we would grab the date, the year, the month, the day, the hour, and the minute. Now, obviously, if you are brave enough, frankly, you want to run your backup every minute, you can do that. Um, we found that every hour was okay, but it would cause issues after a while. So we went with three times a day for our clients, morning, noon, night. It seems to work. It does what it needs to do. We've got variable restore points throughout the day, and it doesn't impact their network too heavily. The next one was space efficiency. Now obviously storage is cheap if you're buying it yourself, but you don't want to fill terabytes of data very quickly with files that are copying the same files. So the hard linking was critical. Now this was a bit of fun, and you have to add both of these items at the same time. And on your initial backup, you have to reference the latest file. So when you create your first backup, your seed, you would then create a natural symlink for that in that first backup to create your latest folder. Then at the end of your script, you would run the first one to remove the current latest option from your file. Then after that, it would create a new symlink to a new latest file. Meaning if you're looking at that data in Cyberduck, for instance, you can see instantly which file is referenced as your latest backup. So if you're looking to restore a file very quickly, you know where to go instantly. Your teams can grab the files very quickly and get it back to the user as soon as possible. So the script now looks like that. So the only other thing I've added in this is the dash progress, just so we can see this files moving. So to make it faster, again, Time Machine was very, very quick. We want to make that as fast as possible over the network. So we would add a size only check. Quite simple, don't bother looking at files that haven't changed size. Only look for files that have a change in size across the board. So if the file doesn't change size, generally it hasn't changed. Don't back up files you don't need, i.e. the .afp deleted hidden files, the DS store files, the, well, you get the idea. And these would be kept in a .txt file in a line separated value. So there is a list of files that have these file types excluded and then store them somewhere centrally. So we chose library backups and a file group. And then you merge that into the backup script. So now it looks like that. So it's starting to grow and starting to become a backup option. Now, the last thing, and in terms of security, was key. Obviously, DNS copying, making something look like something else is quite easy. SSH will tell you because it will recognize a key fingerprint change, and you have to accept that. But if you're running this as a script, you don't get this option. It doesn't show. It just looks at it and fails. So just to add some integrity to it, we added some integrity checks to check the actual fingerprint against the known host file. Now, that known host file is created with a key pair, and obviously the higher level of security on your key pairs, the better, but the recommended would be a SHA-256 pair. Now, on average, it would take a computer many, many, many years to guess a, a, a SHA-256 key, and at the moment it is classified as unbreakable. So what we would do is check with an SSH key scan against the port, for the shark key on the server and check for your actual fingerprint. Now, if that fingerprint doesn't match, it will run two things. So if it's there, it will say, yep, it's all good, carry on. If not, start Wars quote. <laughs> um, this isn't the server you're looking for. Kill it off, move on, start again. Try and find the right server. So, our completed script will now look like that. So this can then run on a cron tab, on an FS tab, or any other method you use. And this will work in macOS and in Linux. Now, the only things that we found with this is that this does not work when you are targeting a NAS. 
They use different R-Sync uh, protocols and they tend to use an R-Sync daemon, which behaves completely differently. So this script will not work. But if you're targeting a Linux box, um, which is what we use, it does work very well and it's very quick. So our average transfer times at the moment, so I'll take one of our clients for instance, they've got a 250 megabit internet connection, we get transfers of between 45 and 50 megabytes per second of their data, and we back up around 50 terabytes of data a month from our clients, and that is three times a day. So it's very quick. Now obviously this is not gonna be replacing end user backups, because our general stance is if it's critical data, it belongs on the server anyway. So um, the idea being that we are only targeting servers. Now, what about Windows? Obviously, I haven't mentioned Windows up to this point. Now, this is possible. We have a lot of Windows servers that we look after, but there are some prerequisites. So RSync can be installed by using third-party tools. So you need to install libssh2 and OpenSSL. They are, op they are both open source. And a very kind gentleman called Ji Chen um, has built a full AcroSync library, which completes a full Linux setup for rsync settings. So you can run a Mac script using AcroSync completely within Windows, with no problem at all. He also does a GUI option, which makes it a lot easier to configure. Uh, and with that, you can then build different profiles at different times, you can do fingerprint matching, you can do password installs wherever you like. Obviously, the preferred option is a fingerprint install rather than a password, but if that's not possible in your environment, then you have the options. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Can you just talk a bit more about your data at rest encryption? Yep. You said you're using encrypted hard drives. Yes. Presumably that's only protecting if somebody was to take the hard drive out of the device. Like, if an uh, attacker was able to get into your network, yep. can they read all your clients' backup data? So the only way to access our server, I'm talking from our server as such, uh, we use authorised keys on all of our devices. There is no password access to our server at all. And password access is completely irrelevant. So the only way to access our data is via the console in vCenter um, or via a known host SSH file on our authorised devices. So there is no way to log into our server via a password. Um, now, obviously, it is entirely dependent on your environment as to how you set up your server. Um, and our disks are encrypted using Lux256 uh, encryption keys uh, with 64-bit you randomly generated passwords that, yeah, chances of you getting them soon. Um, you, but yes, you're right. It only protects them if the disk is accessed or stolen. It doesn't protect them if you are able to get onto it. It's just that in our environment, you're not actually able to get onto it. So, yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone, um, last session for the evening, um, we have Henry from Cloudflare, uh, be nice, as you have been, uh, over to you. Um, so you already know my name, which is great, I don't have to repeat it. Uh, if you do forget it during the session, uh, you can ask me again. Uh, but other than that, it's also written here. In any case, you might be wondering why I'm even speaking. If you know Cloudflare, um, you might know that we are mostly concerned with securing websites and kind of making sure people don't go offline. Um, all about like external networks and that sort of stuff. Uh, but this is more of you know, an IT admin crowd. So why am I even here talking about Cloudflare? What do I even know? because I'm not an IT admin, I'm like in our new product team, right? I launch new things that we have at Cloudflare. And it just so turns out that over the last couple of months and years, we actually started taking our expertise with external networks and applying it to internal networks. So we're trying to secure your MacBooks, yay. Um, 
And if you have any internal applications, right, maybe you're an IT admin or maybe you're in security, you want to make sure that these internal applications are secure. If you're wondering what is an internal application, think about things like a Jira or a Salesforce, maybe your internal code base, literally anything that should only be accessed by you inside your company, not by your customers, not by whatever, some random person on the street. And of course, right, if it's internal, it should be internal, right? So what do you do? You build a wall, right? Uh, as Donald Trump does, right? So private things, you build walls around, nobody can get in, great. Um, but now you have a problem because actually, sometimes, you know, while most of the time people are in your office and in your Wi-Fi and etc., they can access your stuff, you know, they will eventually leave your office, they might work from home, they might be traveling. So how do you allow them to get in? That's kind of where traditionally VPNs come in. Right, so maybe all of you are using VPNs or have used them in the past. It's sort of the traditional solution to this problem. And you can see here, you know, they break this like whole 3 d perimeter. You have this nice uh, wall that you built, and using the VPN, you get through it. Um, and there's a couple of problems with that, right? So the two main ones are sort of outlined here. The first one is that as you give people a VPN, um, you usually give them full access to your internal systems, even though they should only see whatever, the code base of the engineers, they might now also be able to access all of your customer lists, as an example, right? Um, it's kind of free for all. That's a bit of, you know, you can obviously configure it a bit, but the initial way that VPNs work doesn't intend to have that sort of granularity. Then the second piece, and anyone who's used a VPN ever probably knows this problem, is that they tend to be quite slow. Um, and that's fairly logical, right? Because you are effectively tunneling into another person's network. And if you are physically in, let's say, San Francisco, and your office is in London, well, your entire traffic will have to go across the Atlantic and back if you want to do anything. So naturally, it's going to be quite slow. And as a result of that, you will have a pretty hard time to find anyone anywhere who will tell you that they love their VPI, right? Uh, if you find someone, let me know. I'm, I've been looking for a while. I haven't found any. So now, you know, I've been kind of uh, shit talking about VPNs a little bit. What's the alternative, right? How can we do this in a better way? And that's sort of where zero trust comes in or perimeterless security. And you might have heard this before. It's a bit of a buzzword, right? It's kind of unfortunately been thrown around so many times that people don't even know anymore what it really means. Um, so I'll try to illustrate this a little bit with beer as a service because everyone likes beer. And if you don't like beer, you can just replace this with like milkshakes or vegan milkshakes or whatever you like, right? I don't, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but beer as a service is sort of the idea. And full transparency, uh, the, this be as a service or BAS, short. Um, it's not, it wasn't my idea. I kind of saw it on uh, Dero Security, which is another company in the space, uh, on their blog, which is a, a great blog. Uh, and kind of took sort of the idea from them and uh, added a little bit of Cloudflare flavor to it uh, and improved a couple of things because the blog post is already almost, almost three years old. So um, we have a couple of things here, and I'll sort of try to explain perimeterless security based on that. So the, the general idea of perimeterless security is that instead of having this wall, which we draw around our internal stuff, we basically instead ask every single person who tries to access an internal resource if they're allowed to do this, if yes, why, can they prove it, and if they can prove it, great, let them in, kind of make a note of it, and carry on with our lives. That's sort of the general idea. And in this case, we have Paul. He's our user. He's a stick man. Very sad. Um, and he has a wristband. We'll kind of talk about what that means in a second. And Bob wants to get beer, right? And because that's what Bob likes to do. Um, and in this case, beer, the beer stand really is just an analogy for many other service providers that you might have. So SP is the service provider. Um, again, it might be Salesforce. It might be Jira. It might be whatever internal application you have. And uh, really, all of these services, whatever they might be, uh, they shouldn't really handle credentials themselves, right? They shouldn't have to have separate passwords for each of them because, you know, single sign-on is pretty nice. And in order to sort of achieve that, we have to have federated access, right? We have to outsource who is handling the credentials. So instead of having different passwords for each of them, we just tell uh, one of these identity providers on the left to just take care of that. Right? Uh, in this case, we have wristbands. So the idea is basically, if I want to get a beer and go to the beer stand, the beer stand will say, 
that's great, you want a beer, but you're not going to get it unless you have a wristband, right? So then basically I have to go to the wristband stand and say, hey guys, my name is Henry, uh, here's my ID, I really am who I say I am, I'm not lying, I promise. Um, then they give me a wristband, or maybe not if they think I'm lying, uh, and send me back to the beer tent where then I can get my beer and everyone is happy, hopefully. Um, so really one other important thing here to note is that the beer stand really doesn't care of how I got the wristband. All they care about is that I have the wristband. If I had to sort of show them my ID or do a backflip or I don't know, do whatever, right? Show them my birth certificate, they don't care, right? As long as I have the wristband, it's all good. So back to Bob. Uh, Bob uh, is a really smart person. He knows that he needs to have a wristband. So he actually first goes to the wristband uh, stand, gets his wristband and heads back to the beer tent where he then finally gets his beer. Now, how did he get this sort of wristband, right? In sort of tech terms, uh, let's facilitate using SAML, uh, Security Assertion Markup Language. I had to learn this by heart. Uh, so SAML is both a protocol as well as a token. So the protocol effectively facilitates this redirect, right? As you can see, Bob has to walk back and forth quite a few times in order to get his beer. And that's effectively what SAML is doing. It's sending him back and forth saying, hey, if you want to have beer, you need to have this assertion, and without it, you won't get it. So he goes to get this assertion. Once he has it, he's being sent back. And this wristband, effectively, is like a SAML token, sometimes also a JWT token. Um, not going to go into too many details here at Cloudflare. We actually use both different ways of achieving the same goal. But it's effectively a, a piece of code, like a little string, that says this person is who he says he is, so you know, give him his beer. Um, so now Bob's done this, um, he got his beer, and he's happy. But there's still a couple of problems with this, um, but uh, they're fairly easy to overcome. So the first problem is, most people aren't as smart as Bob, so they're not actually going to start at the identity provider at the wristband tent. They just want beer, right? Like They don't care about stupid wristbands, they want to drink. Uh, so they go to, to the beer stand, who then tells them, wait a minute, you can't do this, we don't know who you are, please get a wristband first. Um, so it's one more step, right? one more redirect, not a big deal. Now, it gets a little more interesting because when you think about it from an IT or security perspective, you don't actually want any foot traffic to your beer stand. That's kind of dangerous when you think about it, right? If anyone can just show up and maybe they decide, decide to, instead of showing a wristband, just punch the beer guy in the face and take all the beer, that would be a problem, right? Um, so it would actually make sense to not just sort of leave the stand out in the open. Furthermore, what if, you know, instead of having one wristband, Bob actually shows up with like 10 wristbands and maybe somebody else shows up with another couple of wristbands. And there's so many different wristband providers that the beer guy might just lose track of all of them. And it gets even worse because if we are the owner of this beer stand, we might actually not want to have just one beer stand for tens or hundreds, right? Because you don't just have one internal application, you have loads. And each of these different stands will have different people who can access them or who can't access them and so forth. So it's kind of difficult for this one beer stand guy to manage all of this stuff. What's the solution? Well, the answer is simple. You need a bouncer, right? Uh, you need a basically private security detail for your building who stands in front of your stand and makes sure that no dodgy people get in, right? So this guy, um, in this case, that sort of function is fulfilled by Cloudflare Access. Um, and Cloudflare Access is effectively a bit of a gateway, right? That's allowing people in and out um, and making sure no dodgy people get in. And this bouncer here, um, he, he's doing a lot of things really well, right? So first of all, uh, he has a guest list. So he knows who's allowed to get in and who's not allowed to get in. But when Bob actually shows up for the first time, the bouncer just tells him, look, you don't have a wristband. I have no idea who you are. I'm re being really nice though. So here is a list of all the wristbands I would accept, right? I would accept the Okta wristband. I would accept the Active Directory wristband. Um, if you want, you can even use Google, right? So Bob says, oh, I really like Azure and Active, Di Active Directory. So he walks over to that tent, shows his ID, gets the wristband, right? He has a tiny wristband now goes back to the bouncer and says, okay, great, I've got the wristband, now what? So the access bouncer says, that's good, uh, I know who you are now, Bob, I believe you, I trust you, um, but now I have to check the guest list to see if you can actually come in. Um, turns out Bob's on the guest list, 
so he can go just go ahead and get his spear. Even better, uh, because the bouncer is such a nice guy and cares so much about security, he sort of changed the layout of the entire beer stand. So instead of having the beer stand stand on the street, this is just a facade. It might look like a beer stand, but really once you get in, you have to go through a long tunnel and then you're in the actual beer stand. So the beer stand is safe. Uh, no one can sort of access it unless they go past the cloud for access bouncer, safe on the ground in a nice vault, uh, and no problems from, from any people trying to steal beer. Now, it gets even more interesting, because what if instead of having one bouncer, you actually had 200 of them, right? Because the internet is a bit larger than just a few beer stands, and if you think back to my example at the beginning of how VPNs struggle with sort of sending traffic all the way across the Atlantic, how about we actually check the credentials um, of someone who's trying to access a resource in London, but who is physically in California? How about we just check their credentials in California, instead of sending all of the traffic way over the United States and way over the Atlantic? So that's kind of the idea um, of Cloudflare Access, whereby all of these authorization and sort of auditing functions that the bouncer is kind of taking care of are not just happening in one space, in one single place, one city, but all of our 200 cities where we have data centers. So every time a request comes in, we check if it's valid in San Francisco, for example, and if it is valid, then we will pass it on to the origin. And because all of that stuff is happening via proxy, the resource might just be cached um, in a local server as well. So everything will be lightning fast. Finally, in addition to that, uh, the bouncer doesn't need uh, an application or something like that. He just lives in the browser, right? So you don't have to install <coughs> whatever, and any connect app on your, on your laptop anymore, you just go on Chrome um, and you're good to go. Which also means you can do the same thing on your phone um, if you're in a taxi or even on the airplane Wi-Fi, because there's no more persistent tunnel that you have to sort of keep alive. So if your connection is really, really poor, this is still going to work. Now, if that's all really confusing to you and you have absolutely no idea what's going on, maybe it's kind of funny, but you still don't know what's going on, uh, this is sort of what's going on. Um, Basically, it's kind of the, let's call it flow of a request going through Access. Um, I'll walk you through it very, very quickly. I know it looks kind of confusing at first sight. Uh, but basically, if you're a user, you request an internal application, that's step one. Then the Cloudflare Edge Network would sort of evaluate that request. Um, they wouldn't know who that person is. They didn't see the wristband. So they go ask the identity provider um, to obtain that identification. The IDP then goes to speak back to the user, um, shows them a login page, gets the credentials. If that's successful, they tell the Edge network, look, here's the access token, step five. This person is authenticated, we're good to go. Um, then the next step is sort of for Cloudflare to say, okay, that's good, they're authenticated, can you please also give us their email um, so we know who that person is. Uh, once that's done, we can sort of check in step seven that email against the proverbial guest list, see if that person is actually authorized to access the resource. And if they are, we send back a JWT token, what I mentioned earlier, and redirect the uh, user to the application. So, as I said earlier, a lot of sending back and forth, but the end result, once it's set up, is actually incredibly seamless. Um, and I'll demo that in a second, so you'll have some kind of idea of what this looks like in real life. Um, again, to remember all of the things that are happening, uh, I like to remember sort of the three A's, um, one more horrible three-letter acronym you can remember. But it's basically authentication, authorization, and auditing. And the first step is being sort of done by the identity provider, and the last two steps in this case um, are being done by Cloudflare. But obviously there's other services doing the same thing. So let's try a demo. Um, I'm going to see if I can do this one-handed. Uh, if not, You'll have to just yell at me. So uh, this is sort of the Cloudflare Access dashboard. And the first thing you'll see is that we have a couple of identity providers pre-configured. Um, I found that most organizations, well, most large organizations, tend to prefer Active Directory or maybe Okta. Uh, but if you don't like these, there's actually more that you can configure, right? GitHub, Google, whatever you want. If you have your own custom IDP that you've built in-house, you can just use the SAML integration directly. That's totally fine. Now, let's see what this actually looks like. I'm going to open an incognito window with one hand. Uh, that's pretty good. 
And there is one site that I have called resource on mpl.net. What a great name. What could that possibly be? Um, what we see now is sort of this uh, first splash page, right? So this is the bouncer saying, hey, you don't have a wristband. Here's actually the list of wristbands I would accept. And as you can see, this sort of mimics the previous page where we saw the identity providers that were configured. Um, we're just going to choose Active Directory. And it's going to redirect us to a Microsoft page, which is great. Um, now I have to type in my email real quick. Again, with one hand. I hope I didn't make a typo. Did I make a typo? I did make a typo. Uh, so this would be really handy to have autocomplete here, but for some reason Microsoft doesn't like that. There we go. So now uh, Active Directory is going to recognize that actually Cloudflare has set up an Okta integration whereby instead of using Active Directory to log in, we just use Okta. Uh, this time actually auto populated it for me. And because we use Okta internally, um, we use all of the sort of really cool features that come with Okta, such as two factor authentication. And because we are incredibly security conscious, uh, all of our laptops at Cloudflare have a UB key. So I'm just going to tap that and it should log me in. Fantastic. Sorry, I'm tethering over my phone. Ooh, what a surprise. Access denied. Who could have seen that coming? So this is basically the equivalent of the bouncer saying, great, I've seen your wristband. I know your name, I know you're Henry, but unfortunately you're not on the guest list, right? Shut down. Uh, very sad. Um, we can fix that very easily though by looking at the guest list, right? So in this case, the actual guest list would be the access policy. And as we see here, we have four policies defined. The first one protects prod.resource intra, the next one jira.resource and intra, and the third one is just resource and intra. So we can actually edit this one, and you'll see that. Um, there's a lot of things here. This one is the domain that's been covered, so it's exactly what we're looking for. And then if we go down here, we see the policy. So it's just called my policy, and it says an email that uh, matches this one exactly will be allowed to enter the application. That's not me, unfortunately. Uh, that's one of my colleagues. So let me just enter my own email in here. Uh, great. So now I've got my own email added, and I can save it. And if we go back to the previous window after saving it, and try again, right? So this is basically saying, hey, Mr. Bouncer, can you please check the list again? I'm sure I'm on it, right? And this time, it should hopefully work if the internet allows us to load the website. There we go. So now we log into our internal knowledge base, um, and we've, you know, we've gotten access to the proverbial beer tank. Now, if we kind of keep this analogy going forward, and you actually consider moving your entire organization that's currently behind a VPN, behind something like this, your users might get really upset, right? Because you could have hundreds of applications and they'll get really lost because everything's moved from one place to another really confusing place. So we've kind of tried to make that process a bit easier by creating an overview page where you see all of the services that you have available. Just go here. So this is basically a bit of a splash page where you see all of this, effectively, all of the services where you are on the guest list, so to speak, right? So even though we might have more services running internally and there might be more policies configured, these are the services where a policy says Henry is allowed to access the service, right? So the middle one, uh, we see my policy, which is the one um, that we just looked at, so the resource and intro one. If you click on it, we'll be redirected to the previous page. And now if we go back to uh, our proverbial guest list and edit this policy one more time and remove my name from it and save it and go back and refresh this page a couple of times, well, uh, this policy has disappeared because I no longer have access to it. Now, the final really, really interesting thing, at the very end I mentioned how we changed the storefront, right? And kind of you actually have to go through a tunnel to access your service. That actually wasn't an analogy. Um, so in order to actually secure internal applications, we built a thing that we call Tunnel. And what this effectively does is it's a tool that takes an internally hosted application and exposes it to the Cloudflare Edge, right? Because if you have your self-hosted Jira, for example, um, you need to find a way to securely expose that to the internet 
without just any sort of random person having access to it. And if we kind of go on this test application, it should redirect us to um, an empty page, right? So we get a DNS error, it says, um, you know, this host results, but there's nothing on it. And we can fix that very easily by using my one-handed Mac technique again. So basically, if we look at my terminal, I kind of uh, pre-fill it with a command here. Um, it says Cloudflare D, which is the Cloudflare daemon. And it says tunnel, which is our tunnel. And then it has a host name in it, which is test.resource and info.net. You'll see that matches this one. And then it finally has, uh, it's pointing to my local host where I have uh, an Nginx instance running. And it's effectively just, you know, a proverbial BSN again, right? An internal application. And if we hit enter, uh, it's establishing a couple of tunnels. As you'll see, it's not just establishing one tunnel, but it's establishing four tunnels for redundancy. Um, they are all pointing to London as well as Manchester because these are the two geographically closest uh, Cloudflare data centers to where we currently are. Um, and now, if we go back to this page and refresh it, uh, we see someone browsing the internet as they did in the 16th century uh, using anybody. So that's sort of uh, kind of demonstrating how zero trust uh, works in practice. Um, again, the whole idea here is to make this work with every provider, every identity provider, any application, any SSO, uh, and to make it work in any location geographically in the world uh, to make, you know, security faster as well as safer. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this little presentation, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Right, uh, just a quick word. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I we're still figuring things out. I suspect this is probably our largest meetup we've ever had. Um, as well, thanks to you guys. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, listen to everyone round on um, as we always do. Um, yeah, thanks for making this a big success. Um, in the vein of that, call for speakers. That great really call for speakers. Literally, it is literally pointing. It's all about Steve. Steve hasn't spoken in ages, so we get to see next time. He's, he's volunteered. Um, in addition to Steve, we also have at least three available slots for any any of the next sessions we're going. Um, if you disagree with anything that's been said tonight, if you agree with anything, if you've got something cool you've been working on, something um, that's interesting, or um, you just want to practice a presentation you want to submit to a conference, please contact myself, Neil, Steve. Ben, yeah, Ben's still here, it's good. Ben, Ben's still waiting, it's cool. Ben's still waiting, Ben as well. Um, Graham, if you want as well, he'll surely pass it on um, with the criticism. Um, we'll find out, of course. We'll find out, of course. Um, but, you know, please, if, if anyone's interested in speaking, please let us know, any of us. Um, or if you really want to fancy the gauntlet, chuck it out to the main London channel Slack and uh, fill the back of everyone mocking you, as we always do. And if you don't talk, I might have to, so... If you don't want Ben to talk, you need to volunteer. <laughs> please, please. I listen to him all day. Please, please don't want to. Um, but no, please do. Um, this is supposed to be a nice little um, practice platform for anyone who's interested in speaking more publicly or in larger venues, conferences, etc. etc. Um, and we're reasonably friendly. Um, we don't ask too many questions. Um, you folks said didn't say. <laughs> Um, so I have got a premature slide on here because we are here for another 50 minutes, I believe. Is that right? 20, 20, 20, up to 50 minutes? Up to, up to 50, 50 minutes. Okay. Wow. Ish. Give it a take. Uh, feel free to finish the beers before you go. <laughs> Please. Uh, and or pizza. Um, and without further ado, after that, to the pub. <coughs> I think we're going to the uh, Sugarloaf. It's probably the nearest pub. We're going to try and get in there after this evening. Um, you're very much welcome to join us all. Um, if not the Sugarloaf, I'm sure we'll find eight pubs somewhere in the centre of London to hang out. Thank you all so much, and thanks for making this a great success. Cheers. Thank you.